My friends, I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Why is it that we, people of faith, always doubt and question the power of God to transform our brokenness into new life? And why is it that we always condemn the prophets who call us to imagine a new creation, a world where evil and injustice are overturned and God's reign of life overcomes the shadow of death? And how is it that the institutional church so often inhibits God's plan of life rather than nurture it? and let it flourish. These questions have been very much upon my mind these past few months, and in particular in recent days, they've become much more pronounced as I read the news and updates from England of the upcoming Lambeth Conference. And I would be remiss not to actually speak to this today. Just as the world continues to reel from a global pandemic, the terrifying war in Ukraine, and the recent events that have taken place in the United States, the organizers of the Lambeth Conference, that great conference, some of you may not know this, but every few years all the bishops, Anglican bishops, gather at Lambeth to debate and talk about faith. The organizers of that same conference snuck into the bishop's agenda a document that proclaims not life, but condemnation upon those persons who identify as LGBTQ. Much to the surprise and shock of many bishops from around the world, including the bishops from Canada, the United States, South Africa, to name but a few, the Archbishop of Canterbury, or at least those under his guidance, had decided to once again raise the debate about human sexuality. The document in question seeks not to celebrate life and love that many enjoy, but rather condemns the love and tells the world that God's promise of life is not possible. What are we so afraid of? Why is it that we humans seek not liberation and life for all, but rather guard and protect our rigid beliefs and tell God what God can and cannot do? Why? Why do we do that? As my rage and anger rise as I read the updates, I find myself contemplating St. Anne and the many women before her who suffered much the same. Just when they believed the impossible, their husbands doubted. Their religious leaders questioned their sanity, and the community laughed at them. Yet St. Anne and the woman before her never stopped believing in the power of God to upend and change the world. Before I say more, let me say a little bit about the stories of St. Anne and the other matriarchs of our faith who believed in the power of God to give life. While little is known about St. Anne, the grandmother of Jesus, early Christian writings relate to us that she was a woman unable to conceive a child. Her husband, Joachim, Depressed and distraught by the news, left Anne for a while and ignored her suffering. Despite the abandonment and likely questions among her neighbors and friends, Anne continued to hope and believe that God would grant her a child. Finally, we are told, after her husband had returned to her, Anne conceived of a child, a child whom we now know as Mary, the mother of Jesus. Although her story turned joyful, Anne's story is notable more for her unending commitment and belief in the power of God to change and transform the ways of this world and breathe life into the darkness of places. While everyone said no to her, 
She said yes. Anne is also exemplary to us of a steadfast faith that never fails to believe in the life-giving power of God. Despite the extraordinary suffering she must have endured, Anne remained convinced that God was about to do a new thing. So to the ancient matriarch, Hannah, the woman we read about in our first lesson today. Although not included in the passage read today, Hannah was another woman who suffered profound isolation and exile from her community, as she too was not able to give birth. Convinced that God desired otherwise, Hannah remained ever hopeful God was going to do something great. So she prayed night and day for God to transform her tears of suffering into tears of joy. She, too, suffered much in the same way as Anne. Her husband remained utterly clueless as to why his wife was not happy. He thought she, he was all she needed. And the temple priest, Eli, scorned her for weeping and wailing in the temple, for he thought she was simply a drunken woman. Despite the men's cluelessness, and it seems men tend to be clueless in the Bible a lot, let's put it that way, Hannah remained convinced God was to do a new thing. And so she, too, eventually gives birth. Birth to one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament, Samuel. While we may be tempted to think of the miraculous fertility of Hannah and Anne as the central themes of our stories, I think it's something altogether different. For one thing, we now know that conceiving a child is much more complex than what it was once believed in ancient times. For another, these were not simply miraculous stories of new birth. Rather, they are stories of God upending the world just when everybody thought they got God all figured out. This becomes clear when we read today's first lesson, Hannah's Song of Praise. Hannah sings not to the birth of her child, but God's way of turning the world upside down and elevating those who have been humiliated and marginalized by society. Just listen to a couple of the phrases we heard in that song this morning. The bowels of the mighty are broken, but the feeble grid on, gird on strength. God raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. The point of Anna's story and Anne's, given the church's appointment of this passage for her feast, is not about miraculous births, but the power of God to radically confront injustice and suffering and to breathe life into new places where the proud and mighty belief ought to not be held. In other words, this passage, and I mean this, this passage actually ought to terrify those of us who are in power and authority, who are rich and well-to-do. For we have received a reward. Jesus warns us of this in Luke's Gospel. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your reward. Simply put, those of us who enjoy power and privilege and enjoy a place at the table today will not on the last day if we ignore those who suffer from injustice. That's important. If we enjoy power and privilege today but care not for those who are marginalized and set aside, we will not on the last day. Now, this isn't a hellfire sermon because it's hot. <laughs> I'm not trying to make you suffer. But this is something we need to pay attention to. And for religious leaders, bishops, and priests who think they know what God thinks, an even greater judgment shall be pronounced upon them. 
Thus, as a priest, I seek not to condemn, but to proclaim life. Life to those who live in the darkest of places and who are marginalized by church and society. As I shared with the wardens the other night while sharing dinner, I will be a priest for all. And I pray you will be a church that welcomes all. Particularly those who have been unjustly condemned as being sinful or lost and forgotten by society because of homelessness, substance abuse, or mental health issues. If we are, as a church are more concerned with uttering judgment and condemnation upon others, then we will experience an even more terrifying and wrathful day when Christ comes among us in glory at the final resurrection of the living and the dead. If we cannot proclaim life and believe that God is a God of life and will bring life when no one believes life shall be, then may God have mercy upon us. But my friends, there is another way. We can embrace the way of St. Anne, the way of Hannah and Sarah, the great mat matriarchs of the Old Testament, and Elizabeth and Mary, the matriarchs of the New Testament, and sing out with joy that our God is a God of life, a God who yearns to breathe life into our mortal and broken bodies. A God who abides in those who love, even when the rest of the world says that love is not possible, such as the bishops who wrote that dreadful document that's being now presented before Lambeth. I believe that all of us here at the parish of St. Anne's are called to believe in the tremendous power of God to breathe life into a world burdened by pain and suffering, loneliness and isolation. Our mission as a church is to be a light to the city, a beacon of hope to all people, and our ministry must be for the life of all. Not to those whom we like, not to those whom we think are just, but to everybody in this world. This is not a place for us to say what is impossible, but for rather for us to proclaim what is possible, what God can do, what the God of life can bring about among us. Let us mean what we say each Sunday at the very end of our liturgy. Glory to God, whose power working within us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. And believe, believe and act that God is a God of life, particularly when others say no. Amen.